Our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hoddle Wars Summer 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller live and direct central London or as central as you need to be, could be, want to be. Believe me, we are in the centre of London, you don't want to be anywhere else. Inside the house, would you please make some noise and turn it up for Bunny Bread, Mellow, Devastate, let's go! Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. To my right, your left, the first one of the chain, is the man like Bunny Bread, aka Mr. Nonstop. AK State of Art. And then next to him is the man, the one that pioneered the sound. Big shout out to Rodney P in the place as well, and all the others. But this gentleman, Miss Stephanie Battersea representing MC Mello inside the house. And in all, we have a gentleman that not only scratched his way through sets, he was also the producer of the awesome <laughs> Demon Boys. This is DJ Devastate inside the place. How are we, gentlemen? How are we feeling? Can we get those mics a little bit closer to your One, one. Can I say squeeze in devastate? One, squeeze two. in devastate. Oh, I'm squeezing. There we go. Get it all in. There we go. It's like an Ikea opening in here. So let us begin, gentlemen. And uh, some of your compadres at the back will most definitely remember these golden days. But uh, for all of us that perhaps weren't there at Covent Garden or Charing Cross, tell us exactly what it was like back in the back in the early days when hip-hop landed like a virus in the UK and global. And of course we've got the DJ, we've got the MC, and we've got the writer, so we've got all different perspectives here. Let's start with yourself, Bunny B. Why? <laughs> hey everybody, nice to see everybody, some new faces and some old faces. And you know what? Yeah! I'm, I'm blessed that we are still here right about now. Amen to that. Oi, all right, if I can go back a bit. Take it right I, back, I will, I will forget nothing, so some people in there will be able to aim me here. My first kind of understanding of the culture was a friend of mine called Yankee, Paul Hibbert, who, uh, not that beatbox Yankee, it's a different Yankee. Okay, he was living in um, <laughs> Denver, Colorado. Friend nice. of mine, Corey, was a next door neighbor. He was a cousin. And he came from Colorado, was living with um, Corey next door. And he used to tell us about this thing called the worm on the floor. The worm, the worm, can you, do you? I said, what do you mean the worm? I don't get that. It doesn't make, and the thing is, he was a crap dancer. <laughs> Shit at dancing, two left feet. He knows it, he knows it's true. And he was explaining this thing to us, this worm thing. You know, and there's a thing where they kind of do the legs, go around, didn't understand that made no sense. If you don't see it, you know, we couldn't put it in the mind's eye. And just to jump forward and back a little bit, Buffalo Girls appears, then it makes sense. I said, oh, that's what you meant. Yeah, that. So if, if I look from a graph perspective, there are some serious, serious unsung heroes that hardly anybody knows Let's about. Let's get into it. Really. <laughs> Let's get into um, it. There's a writer called Courtney that's what he wrote, Courtney. And we used to go to this community center. Thank the Lord for the community centers. Why? Mm -hmm. And um, he used to like do these amazing graphs. Wasn't sure what it was at the time. Pure duplicolor, pure duplicolor. Man who know, know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? And the stuff that he, because I've seen some pictures recently and I'm like, wow, you did that with duplicolor? He was one of the first people that I'd ever seen doing graphs. So he, he was part of a crew called the Radical Crew from Listen Grove, Alex, Steve, and I can't remember the other day. And they were some of the first people I used to see cut and scratch. What? They were, used to go to a place called Language Lab, Titanic, anybody? Anyone? All right, we're going back now, right? So then man, if I could just explain, Mick and Tom used to do this thing called Language Lab in Mayfair somewhere, a place called Titanic. What they do, and I love this concept, I semi use it but not quite. They'd have a picture of like, they play music, playing tunes, mixing them together, very simple. 
but they have images of like Cupid the color, guards just marching. And then all of a sudden you see like porn, quick go. <laughs> and you're like, hold up a minute, you're still dancing. Then you see like a yacht going down the Thames and all of a sudden more porn gone. And it was strange, but I, I kind of rated the concept, you know, because it kept you kind of alert what was going on. So big shout to them, man, there. If you get a chance to find them early, early, mix and cut. I have to also then talk about Mastermind Roadshow, right? Can't, I can't Come go on. any further without talking about Mastermind. And they are so integral. They started, started off as reggae sound system. They're based kind of Wills and Halls and Kendall Rise. And we would follow them like Carnival. We'd follow them everywhere. Wherever they'd go, we would be there to learn from Mastermind. I remember one day, my early DJ days, um, I was playing in a park, trying to mix some records together. And the sound was going down and coming back. Didn't realize, but I'm like, hey, my mixing's not, what's going on? <laughs> or could I pride myself as being quite decent at mixing? But then I went and I saw Mastermind play somewhere, and they had this big box right next to them, which I realized was a monitor, which they, and it was a big outside place, but they were mixing yeah. with Chris, you know. But I could go on and on, but you know, let it, let it flow, let it flow. Well, he bred inside the place, telling me. Let it flow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. Mello, I've, I've, I've got to ask you, because while we're on the subject of sound systems, I mean, it goes without saying that as soon as hip-hop landed in the UK, it, it was able to form its own style based on traditions and culture that already exist, and sound systems definitely played a big part of that, and I know that played significantly for you and your journey. Yeah, I would say for me and for most, you know, Rodney P, like, you know, Devastate can say this. Everybody here can say that because of the era we come up in, yeah? yeah? So the sound system thing, like I said to you earlier, we already had an understanding mm -hmm. of lyrics uh -huh. over rhythm. Can you convince me with your words? Yes, you bloody well can. Okay, I'm gonna make some noise, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like all of the rules, all of the laws were already set in place. So when the, when the hip hop come from, I'm, I'm talking about like electro wasn't necessarily like that, you understand? Mm -hmm. Electro was another new thing, but you know, it still had some of the kind of funk flexes and flavors to it so that, you know, we could get with that too. For sure. Plus it was ridiculously dope. But when we started hearing MCs like Funky 4 Plus One and, you know, and Cold Crush and everybody else, you're seeing mic skills on a rhythm track, turntable, microphone. Crazy. So. When the hip hop come, we're, we're ready for this thing. Uh -huh. But we're young, yeah? And we're still developing. You understand, we're still developing. I'll tell you this, the first time I held a microphone in public was behind Covent Garden, uh, Jerry Damers from uh, The Specials. Specials. What? He used to have a thing called AAA, Artists Against Apartheid. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing, whenever we used to come from raves and that, you had to go to Trafalgar Square to get your night bus. So you, you have to do your stop off at the South African Embassy, blaze a spliff, have a chat to yeah, yeah, you know, it was a non-stop boycott outside the embassy. So, you know, a mandala, South Africa every time. So we go down, you know, you go down into uh, Trafalgar Square where everyone's got to get their buses and and, and go home or whatnot, and I've actually forgot my point. <laughs> the point being, <laughs> yeah, 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 Jerry Damage, Jerry Damage. <laughs> right. You know, I might look 32, but I'm a little bit older. <laughs> right. So anyway, I want to tell you this because he had artists against apartheid, sound system set up, warehouse flex behind Covent Garden, and that night, Rodney P, Bionic, myself, and there was other people there, definitely, you know, maybe Basil, a few others. And this was the first night that I held a mic in a place properly, right? We had been rhyming in the block, in the flats, on the road, to beatboxing, to finger clap, everything we've been doing mm -hmm. that. But it's the first time on a mic. And uh, I think it was, it was either the Wild Style Rhythm or Dollar Bill. 
that was being played. And I remember, man, that moment, you get the moments in your life, decision time, decision time. Do I take this mic or do I poop my pants and don't take the mic, right? I took that mic in my hand and then I spoke into that mic and I heard my voice coming back. And just like when Bunny was talking about, you know, there wasn't a monitor, it was coming back. Okay, Jerry Dammers had a monitor. <laughs> we could hear ourselves. And I spat my bars and I knew this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and Rodney was there and Bionic was there and they spat their shit and I knew that they knew that this is what they're going to do. Yeah. And so I'm saying that was a birth, a birth moment there. All of the stuff we explained before about foundations, sound system, reggae music, funk, boogie, the whole lot, it all came together for that moment. Yeah, it was all residing in us for that moment. Boom, it came out and confirmed us in what we know we can do and what we're about. So that same thing applies to everybody. The first time someone decided to jump in the circle, and pop, lock, break. The first time someone decided they're gonna let someone hear them cutting up. The first time someone decided they're gonna risk going to a yard where they can get arrested, they're gonna spray a train, or they're gonna spray a wall. Mm -hmm. Everyone had their birth. Hip hop is talking about birth. To me, it's also talking about renewal, because every time you deal with your art form, you, you're kind of born again. You, you're, it's fresh again, you see me? And so, one of the things that I look at is how hip hop culture can be just that same attitude, if we apply that to anything in our life, you understand, uh, uh, we're winning. Um, I think I just have, just have yeah. to add that. Yeah. Can I just chime in on the sound system culture? <clears throat> okay, so for me, let's just talk about sound system culture. Like in 1985, I was into Saxon, Coxon, mm -hmm. Unity, and Jam Down Rockers. <clears throat> Excuse Jam me, so we used to exchange sound tapes in school. And I just fell in love with people like Dad, Papa Levi, Daddy mm. Colonel, Rusty and Sandy. Yeah. So, because yes, they, yes. they were kind of, they were chatting in Jamaican, but they were like doing it in Cockney as well. Yeah. So when it came to our time to kind of get into the UK hip hop stuff and people like London Posse and Mello, they were kind of chatting like that. So it kind of resonated with me. So in terms of the sound system culture, I learned how to DJ as a sound man in blues dances. I did my chops in like, back in the day when we used to break into houses and we used to put like bin liners on the windows <laughs> and there was sweat coming on the, you know, coming, coming, coming through the window. So that's where I kind of learned how to kind of DJ. So I'm from a reggae background, but the hip hop bug really bit me when I went to New York in 1985 with my friend Terry. We always say that we went to America with Saxon tapes and we came out with Dougie Fresh, Lisa, Lisa. <laughs> Like, we had like the uh, Puma trainers, the Cos La Tigra. So, yeah, that's where my kind of like journey from hip hop, how I kind of got into hip hop. It's wow. incredible. The, te the technology of its day was limited. The idea of yeah. doing or replicating what was going on on the radio or in clubs or when you seldomly get a chance to watch it on TV. Like, how did you guys pick up? the materials that existed? Because all three of you are in different lanes here, so this will come with some different answers, I'm sure. Devastating. In terms of the material, I mean, <clears throat> I was fortunate because my brother is about six years older than me. So he was collecting funk, boogie, jazz, or what we now call rare groove. And we also had access to my dad's record, Scar, Old Time Reggae. So we had samples. And I had a good ear for music because I suppose when you've got a brother that's six years older than than you and then you know your friends don't have that I was kind of head of the curb so when it came for us to start making music I had I had a really good ear um, then I think it was in 1987 we got our first MPC Wait. so and I wouldn't say this in front of everybody I'm gonna say it now but I had my MPC before DJ Premier man <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know what I mean so we we had our M <laughs> so, no, seriously, we, we, I had my MPC early, MPC 60, and I really mastered that. I did a lot of chops, a lot of programming on it. <clears throat> then, yeah, so I suppose before that, we were doing, like, tape-to-tape -tape stuff. But then when I got the sampler, yeah, I really came into my own. Whoa. The game changer. Yeah. Mello? 
Yeah, man. First of all, big up DJ Premier. Much love to him. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <laughs> see the album Thoughts released, right? That album was made using an 808 and a 909. That was it. Most of the music, uh, this is due to Sparky. Sparky is a genius. Why is Sparky called Sparky? Because he's an electrician. <laughs> Just in case people didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know for years. And I asked him one day, why are you called Sparky? Goes, I'm a Sparky. I'm an electrician. That's what I'm a trainer now, because I'm a Sparky. I was like, ah. Oh. Anyway, that's what Sparky had. And uh, 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 emulate a keyboard. And the whole album was made from that. Wow. I mean, Sparky's a genius. It's like, <clears throat> it's about what can you do with the most minimal things you have? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you remind yourself every day you're a creator. And I told this to people, you're bringing, you're bringing something from the unknown into the world of the known and then putting a shine on this thing and then presenting it to the people say, there you go. Not even what do you think, what do you feel? You mm -hmm. feel me? Right? So that was, that was, that's all we used. Carmaster Swift, <laughs> Carmaster Swift and, and Pogo, I think they had this little sampler thing, I think it had four second samples on it. Wow. So they would do little loops. Yeah, yeah. But out of that, Swift took the Wildstar movie and cut out the little bits of that Wildstar rhythm and pieced it together I made a dub play of the wild star, you know. Yeah, right. He did that. He told me that recently. He told me that recently. Right, but story not done. Mm -hmm. So we go to New York in 1989. What you mentioned before, there was about 21 of us from Covent, and then there was a couple of men from up north. So we had a crew of about 26. Yeah. And then we met up with the Brooklyn man then from Downstairs Records, and then there's about 30 odd. Mm -hmm. And then we met with all the LA man then. We went to, we went to um, Salt and Pepper's record label thing. Next Plateau. Next Plateau. Ooh. We came down to this club called The World, and we had an army of 60, 70 people, all right, going to The World. Of course, they wouldn't let us in like that. We all to split up. But I wanted to give you that example because we're in New York, and Swift has made this wild style rhythm, put this thing on a dub plate, and then we go to perform. And that's 1989, and we, Pogo bullied the DJs off the, off the set, literally. He bullied them off. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Took off the record. Wow, okay. Put on a dub plate. The whole place went bananas. Wow. I took the mic, I shout out everybody in there. I shout out Brooklyn, but then I shout out London, because that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see these two big hands from that side come over the, the top of the DJ stand, and I saw this head come up with a hat, glasses, and one eye looking this way, one eye looking at me. Freddy, yeah, Fat Freddy, <laughs> Freddy come up. <laughs> the fuck oh, wow. you get that shit? You get that, what the fuck you get that, man? You get that shit from Jazzy B? You get that shit from Jazzy B? Right? Wow. And, 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 no, no, no. Uh, Pogo, Pogo said, nah, man, I think he said, we got it from some obscure shop in Brighton. Right? <laughs> and he was like, and then you see his head shrink back down, right? And I was like, yeah, big up Five Five Freddy. Lyrics, and we toasted that place. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Muggs from Cypress Hill. You know what I remember about Muggs? Go on. Muggs was <laughs> the bar, yeah, where you serve your drinks. Muggs was on the bar, hitting the bottles on the, on the, this is how people were going mad. <laughs> So I'm telling this story just because, again, we had minimal things. Swift had that four seconds, yeah. and he made a, a dub plate that tore the whole place to pieces. With right? restriction so, comes creativity, yeah. each and every yeah. time. There you go. Yeah. Each uh, necessity time. is the mother of invention, yeah. right? Yeah, for sure. It is. And Bunny, from a, from a creative point, the restrictions that did lead to creativity, I mean, for, for Graf, I mean, you know, you were fairly limited at the time. I mean, it was an art trying to find your caps, let alone... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Look, I'm, I'm just going to go straight in. We were little teams. All right? I'm just going to go straight in. You MCs and producers, you were good. No, we were, we were thieves as well. Without us teeth in spray cans, we were 
I always uh, say two, two things were crucial <laughs> to us. Racking and style, mm. those two things. Because you can't get up without racking pain. And if you ain't got style, you'll be told about it yeah. instantly. <laughs> you'll be wiped out of existence. Yeah. You know, straight away. In our generation, anyway. I know it's a little bit pally pally now, <laughs> right? People are nice. Oh, that's a nice tag. Oh, that's some nice 3D. I love the character. In my time, we'll tell you that's fucking shit. Yeah. Your cruise shit, and we'll burn you any day of the week. Max, where you there? Matt Kane, you there? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> you know it. We'll tell man about themselves, <laughs> all right? So, in our day, we had like the cheapest, worst paint you could possibly yeah. think of. One nozzle, car plan and duplicate color. We had a few as time went on, right? But let me tell you, with that little can like that, you had to know your king craft. Mm -hmm. You had to know your craft. All respect to the writers now, you got Brands with like overall, you probably got about 600 colors, right? True that. To, to do True skin that. tones, now you've got about 15 shades of brown, you know? And now for us, then there was um, Sahara beige <laughs> and a dark brown and an off white. So that was it to make a black man, an Indian man, and a white man in tree tones, right? So listen. So don't tell me nothing with this now generation that you're this and you're that and you're that and you're this. It come in my time and let me see you bust them portraits with tree tone, right? So it was hard work. We had to just take what we had and master the craft and try and understand how to fade with the one nozzle, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, for me, I, I was DJing and graphing at the same time, hand in hand. I tried break dancing at the local community centre. I proper did that on my neck when I tried to do a head spin. Never again, yeah. you know. Yeah. So all you B boys and B girls, much praise, much praise. Respect yeah. to you, because I'm afraid I broke my neck, so I never did it again. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, if I can tell you this micro story, so I used to write State of Art in a crew called Nonstop, and how the name came about was. In the early 80s, I was a massive fan of hi-fi equipment. I loved hi-fi equipment. Nakamishi, Pioneer, a and you name it, I loved it. So there used to be these magazines, um, Hi-Fi Weekly, Hi-Fi Monthly, oh, yeah. and you should buy the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. tons of them under my bed. When I used to go through them, there was always this term, the state of the art new turntable, you know, state of the art cassette deck. State of the, you know, and I used to love that term, state of the art. And I was like, you know what? I can use that for me. State of art. You yes. know, the new, the latest, the greatest, the freshest, the newest technology and art. You know, that was the emphasis between, behind the name. So I just merged the two. My love for hi-fi equipment and DJing and to graph as well. You know, so yeah, that's my kind of, like I said, we use the crappiest paint you could comprehend. And there was a brand called Car Plan. Oh. Man know? Man know about oh. Car Plan? That's right, Money that's yellow. right, Drax. And there was a yellow that we used to just call um, orange juice yellow because it was like, <laughs> you remember Tip Top, the orange juice <laughs> is diluted with water? It was like that. <laughs> so, Bruce all you writers Bruce. now, come, roll with us. And it's no, we will, we'll, we'll be taking questions in a second. We will take questions in a second. Big shout yeah. out to writers as well. Big up Drax inside the place. 279 in the building. And all the crew inside the house. And uh, yeah, so my next, uh, my next music. Just, was, just, I just want to ask yeah, you, please right? do. Bunny, can you, like, I remember Chrome Angels, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, could you name, could you tell us some of the, remind us of some of those crews, the writers? Listen, I'm going to go straight in. Hold no bars like wrestlers. <laughs> Re respect to Chrome Angels. <laughs> Respect to them, all right? But let me tell you, see them man from South? We fucking hate it. We hate it. We hate it. Let me tell you this. It's not as glamorous and nicey-nicey as you think it was. Mm. In my time, man was like, don't fucking come in my area, I'm <laughs> I remember one time, 
Big up to London Giants, and I say that, yeah. Anyway, because <laughs> them man were from South, right? It's getting nice and spicy in here, isn't it? Them man were from South, right? It's getting right? juicy now. And yeah, yeah. I remember, Max, you remember this, when they came to our area and they did like London Giants, London Giants, all the way down Labrock Grove, because that's our, our terrain. We were like from Portobello, Labrock Grove, Westbourne Grove, under the Westway, where all the big pillars were, where you had to come and pay. If you wanted to be at anybody, that's where you had to come and pay. And one night I got up and I saw London Giants. I was like, what the fuck? That's a down here writing on our things. And we took it serious. Like, that was our wars, like mine. Like, I paid for it. It was real. It was real. So, if I could quickly say, I spent a lot of time in Covent Garden, but I wanted to spend even more time down in Grove where we could paint and execute yeah, and mm. rule. Because and, in them days, it was real. Man used to get robbed. Mm, mm. Man used to get tucked in. Man used to come from far and get their cameras and shoes and trade money taken from them. It was it a joke? So I know there's a nice side of it, but if you want me to stop talking, I will. No, I mean, it, what's interesting <laughs> is the, the, the times, things like the robberies, the, the behavior, the nuances, the social behavior, political. Explain a bit more, Devastate, of what it was like in London at the time that made London hip-hop flourish in the way it did. Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, <clears throat> what made London hip-hop the way it was, was for us, you know, the black kids, first generation, parents came over from the Caribbean, so we had that influence. We couldn't, I mean, I, I, looking back, I was trying to make hip-hop that sounded like New York hip-hop, but I just couldn't, looking back, because I'm not from New York. I couldn't even deny the reggae influence if I wanted to. And that was ironically what people liked, but I was really trying to make some boo back from New York City. Gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I suppose the influence was definitely there in terms of... Sorry, the original question? Uh, what was the environment like that spawned UK hip-hop? OK, so if you think back to the 1980s, you've got Maggie Thatcher, you know, she was, um, she was on everybody's next. But I'll say the good thing about the 80s was that we had youth clubs. Mm, yeah. So, we, yeah, mm -hmm. so we, we had an outlet. And for me, being a DJ, there was always turntables somewhere. Mm -hmm. Whether somebody had a belt-driven turntable in a youth club or whether a mate had a turntable, there was always stuff, there was always equipment, pool tables. So we had an outlet. So there wasn't like what we have these days where you couldn't go to a certain area. I remember growing up, especially going to hip-hop raves. I'm from Tottenham. I used to live in Tottenham. I raved in South London, mm. East London, mm. West London. Mm. No problems. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, I raved, I raved, ev yeah. I raved everywhere. Yeah. I, I felt yeah. safe. I felt yeah. safe and secure. Yeah. So there wasn't, there wasn't a place in, in London that I couldn't go to or yeah. I didn't feel that I could... You know, I mean, I remember going to South London to show Rodney. Yeah. I go, I see you guys in West London. Everywhere, man. I used to go to hip hop jams. I mean, see, I see all of you guys in in, in hip hop jams. So it was like, the from looking back, it was a really, it was a really healthy time. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, we had places to go. We could socialize. Um, I mean, you can even take it back as far as play schemes. Yeah. You know, from places wow. to youth clubs, we had we had places yeah, to go yeah, to. Yeah, so yeah. I don't look back in them days and think, God, it was it was a dark time. You know, none of my friends got stabbed or robbed or anything like that, mm, yeah. and we weren't bad men. Yeah, yeah, you understand. Yeah. So it was, it was a nice, it was a nice time. We were poor, but it was a nice time. <laughs> you know, I like to just, just want to add something to that. Just to what everyone said. Like, remember, there weren't all the technology, mm. all right? There was no social media, there was no mobile phones. Even in the early stages of the eighties, there weren't even pages. It came a bit later. So you had to, but yet, yeah, everyone knew everyone. And you knew everyone properly. Mm -hmm. Like, you go to each other's houses. <laughs> or like each other's estate, <laughs> right? You knew each other, you socialized, you hung out together. And like we were saying in the earlier thing, like, if you're gonna be meeting somewhere, you gotta arrange that thing before, cause you can only phone a house or a phone box, right? So because of that, Everybody was hand to hand, face to face, with, 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 with each other. And, and, and the BMP did a very good job of uniting us <laughs> as well. 
You understand? And, and yeah. So with all of the bad stuff that was going on, and we were we were young, we had each other, and all that bad stuff, we could turn that energy into our art form. Yeah, that's right. And also, it was also hip hop was rebel music too. It was it was our like lick back. It was our busting shots back. Mm. That's really important because I look at it now and it's like I think there's everyone is so much more remote. I could yeah. go to, I could go to Tottenham. I could go Hackney on the regular. I had to take holy portrays to go to this man's yard, Danny. Yeah. Right? I could go anywhere. West, I, I learned how to, to to body pop and and all that stuff from Mastermind Roadshow down at Mobley, mm. down at Labour Grove. Mm. Mastermind themselves with my teachers from the very you beginning. Know I used to go there all the time. Oh, what the hell? Every Thursday, I get the 295 from Battersea. Seed! Uh, <laughs> right? Big. Wow. Listen, <laughs> Labour Grove, I love Labour Grove. Always have love. Could go all over London. Then hip hop and the music took us to Birmingham, yeah. Yeah. Manchester, yeah. Sheffield. Yeah. You go on all dayers. Banging. I don't know if those things are happening. Yeah. And it weren't dangerous. Yeah. Okay, at the end of the night, <laughs> everybody yeah. is going to have fisticuffs with each city, right? <laughs> but nobody got stabbed or things like that. Yeah. It was boys yeah. being silly and some girls. Yeah. And everyone goes home happy. So, you know, that was important. That was important. I don't know I don't know if young people are gonna have that again. Plus there was parties, there was jams, there was shabine. Mm -hmm. yeah. You didn't have to yeah. get you know, you could you can take up the carpet in your yard, take out the furniture, bring in some speaker boxes and have a party and it weren't illegal kind of thing. That's right. So yeah. Golden eras, man. Bunny, anything yeah. to add? Um, can I just big up Nutriman? Ah, oh, yes. All right. Absolutely. Founding if, father. If man don't know who Nutriman is and his rock box nights, he should have beg, find out. Man had the wickedest, wickedest hip hop jams you could Absolutely. ever think of. Legend. Early A's. Please look up Nutriman. You're speaking in the book. Yeah. 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 I've spoken in the book. Is it? I, I'll say this. I don't know if anybody else felt like this, but when I was when I first immersed into hip hop culture and was painting and stuff, I thought I was gonna be there forever. <laughs> I don't know, but for me, yeah. I thought I'm gonna be doing this exact same thing forever. I'm gonna be 16, 17 years old for the rest of my life. Nothing and else those, matters as much. And those exactly. parents, them people called parents, mm. I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> that's me now. But, uh, <laughs> but to, to, on, a, on a real note, um, I think it was, like you say, Melo, it, it definitely pulled us together. Yeah. I'm going to say I have friends now, mm. good, bona fide friends. Yeah. Lifelong friends. Who are here now. They're all in the building. Make some noise. Yeah. And, and Asian brothers. Mm. White brothers, black brothers, yep. and then my brethren right till now in yep. my late fifties. And hip hop did that. Yes. You know? Amazing. That's Absolutely. what hip hop did right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. That kept me, that brought me lifetime brethren. Absolutely. Lifetime. And globally as well. Yeah. When you're in Covent Garden and all people are coming from all over the world, they gotta come down to Covent Garden, we all get linked up. All right? It's we got fr all of us have got peoples all over the world. I'm talking pre social media mm. people from all over the world because mm. of this music, because mm. of this culture. Incredible. You know what I mean? Yeah. Big up Normski trying to hide in the back there. Yes. Yeah. 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 Can I even add? Um, we had a pen pal friend yeah. who would send us graffiti images. Wow. One of the guys was called Hex, right. and he would send us stuff, mm. and we'd. Right, oh Hex, that's lovely, I love that. New York, hey. No, 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 no,
first of all, thank you all very much for starting this craft in, in London. Uh, the hip hop. Uh, I contributed to the craft. <laughs> and, and everything there that was a struggle to make it what it is today. That's the first thing. The second thing is once you got your skills up to that level, who did you pass it on to? Okay, so once, once, just for the for the audio, and uh, once you got the skills up, who did you pass on your skills to, generationally? If I could go quick, I'm still doing it now, yeah. Because I'm still painting, still DJing, and I'm painting probably more than I've ever painted. And there's people, youngsters that I paint with, and I pass it on to them before I kick the bucket and say, look, learn this, it's the little that I know, have it, run with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, there's a lot of there's a lot of guys and girls a little bit younger than us that they're with us. So Sparky's teaching them programming. We're going through the whole MCing thing. Pogo's teaching them DJing, bringing them up and then getting them out there. Um, that was happening, but that was also happening with people you just met and became friends with. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm gonna use this word. No, it's a bad word now, grooming. But the reality is, <laughs> you were teaching people and, and bringing them through in the art form. And because there was a space for them to do it, they made it their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Devastate? For me, nobody was interested, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you why, because most of the people that I knew, most of the people that I knew, they wanted a rave. And like, when you're, when you're an artist and you're doing this thing properly, you've got to, you, you got to, sit, you got to sit at home, man. Yeah. You've got to put the hours in, you've got to really kind of be antisocial. You can't be at the cool places. So the people that I wanted to bring in, they were like, nah, man, you've been, you've been programming that beat all day. I want to go out. So there was nobody that was really interested when I, you know, at the time that I was doing it. Then they ended up dancing to your music. Mm. Yeah, yeah true <laughs> that, true that. Any more questions from the front there? Anybody, don't you be shy now. Here we go. Go on, one for Bunny. Oh, rise, rise. So, Early on in the doors of hip hop, we had the 82 New York City Rap Tour, which was kind of the thing that happened, which introduced a little bit of hip hop to yeah. stuff. And um, where, where did you start seeing American influence coming into the graph game? Pre-86. Right, where did you see the influence of Graf coming um, pre-86? I think, I think we definitely looked to Futura's piece, right. where he did in uh, Westbourne Grove by the train tracks. Futura drops a tag there. And I'm living at the bottom end of South Kilburn. Yeah. Futura's there and he does a tag, Don D, Fab Five, Freddy, Futura, high Ooh. up on this wall. And then if you go by Balbury Road, part of Labrook Grove, he's doing it on corrugated iron. Remember the last time you ever see a corrugated iron? Huh. And you see like Futura tags and then like some of them are upside down. So he's obviously, he's yeah. coming here with the clash and we're sort of seeing that. And even the first stuff by crew, Scam and them seeing yes. their stuff. Mm. And the guy mentioned that earlier, Courtney, seeing their influences. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Riverside with Lee. Yeah, I remember going to that. I think I had a little argument with Mo there. Wow. Was that, when he was, was that when he was called Artis? Yeah, when he was called RT. Yeah, I think I had an argument with him. I like Mo, I love Mo, yeah, I but love I went to argue Mo's with him that night. You know what, the thing was, the two kind of intellectual, philosophical kind of brothers that I used to like to sit down on the cobbles with and chat with and listen to was you and Modi. Was I intellectual then? Yes, brother. <laughs> you used, when you used to talk about public enemy... Sorry, Bunny. Brother, Bunny, you, you, brother, Bunny, you, you... Not intellectual, Frank. but my queer. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. Right. I'm hearing bursts, and you are still yep. liberated. Right. Bunny, Bunny, okay, brother. You. Bunny, brother, you've always been a deep, a deep brother, man. Always. And I still love Thank that. You. Love that. Nice. You know what I mean? Nice. Got to, got to say you. Thank you. Thank you. Respect. When did Brim come over? 85? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I still yeah. got my Brim t-shirt. Still? Yeah, yeah. Because he, he, he did a piece on my, and Kilburn I wrote where I live. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he said Brim. Then this girl did a thing called <laughs> Fish, and then I did something, and then the uh -huh. next guy, Shades, yeah, did a piece. Yeah. Can I just, can I just interject you, there when you talked about the t-shirt? What is it with you? What is you guys are hoarding like oh, mad God, stuff? Start. What is this? He did it by hand himself. Yeah. Right. I can't let that go. Like, no. Yeah. I got a Queen Latifah t-shirt still in the bag. 
from uh, when we toured together, eighties, whatever. Wow. Right. Yeah. Got enough T-shirts. No, they got to keep them. Got to keep them. Yeah. Got to keep. Even though they faded and pull out. They don't fit me anymore, so you got them. Do the This is a weird thing because um, I was part of the bike back in the day, sort of thing, and I moved house about eighty-five times. But some of my stuff is I don't even know where it is. And you guys have managed to keep the thing. Yeah. And that is part of the thing that we have to keep for our, our, our hip hop. Because yeah. otherwise, what could, what could happen, it's my opinion, would be, would be for place. And, and, and then. <laughs> you're, 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 you're on the so, my thing is, if we don't keep it to ourselves, and I should tell myself yeah. as well is that somebody will one day usurp it from us yeah. and say we didn't do it yeah. and say they came up with it. So 100%. it's all about proof of... Proof 100%. Of That's why the DJ okay. still got my record gotcha. and still play them. Gotcha. So what do you think about that um, as, a, as a thing that we have to do in the world we live in? Because Pre- to me it's a bit horrible. Preservation. Yeah. Preservation. Preservation. Take, make archives. Take your stuff collectively. You're doing it here. You've got like Actually, magazines yeah. and records and... For archive sure. our own shit. Yes. And we'll take you everyone know. around the back later when we finish here. You can come yeah. around and see the rest yeah. of the arts arcade. Archive your own shit, man. And Don't do you know, give it away. Do yeah. you know, Bunny, you know where you, where you see a perfectly, massively brilliant example of that is in the book. Right. Yeah, this yeah. book here documents, right here. archiving, everything. It's and all it's here. our words. That's the key thing yeah. about it, as we say them, but as we live them. The only thing I'll say is in our era, mm. we didn't have the cameras. Yeah. So I think the only person, all right, we've got bloody Andy, Andy yeah. Norsky, and Norsky, but we, we, didn't have, we didn't have access to, like, a Michelle. Yeah. We didn't have access to, like, phones. I, I wish, if I had half the pictures of the people that I come into contact yeah. with, man, honestly. But the other thing, what's funny to me is back in the day, there's lots of photographs of me doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And I don't have any, you know why? I'm doing the thing in the middle yeah. of the cycle. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm with my head or something yeah, like that. Of course, of course. It. Yeah. And luckily we have people like Normski that did. Yes. Hey. Yeah. Can we make yeah. some noise for Normski? Yeah, He's please, one of my please. absolute heroes. I love yeah. you to bits, Norm. Can I say, go and buy his Blood Clark book. It's wicked. Yeah. His Yo, book is bad and he's an got example. me in it as well. So, so bo- in the other room there, you can go and have a look at Normski's yeah. book. Like, there's lots of books, yeah. magazines. Yeah. You have to go and so check it out. So one more please. question from the crowd, you, you my dear. What- Thank you. I'm going to try and put three questions in one. Okay. okay. Just <laughs> one. <laughs> I work in like culture and arts, and like, I'm, I don't know if I'm ADHD or something or blah blah blah. But basically, my question is: I'm born in the '90s, so you guys were you guys were in the scene, like, so you saw what it, how it affected the culture and like how it changed the world, and, and you're part of it. So I want to know, like, as artists and creatives, what difference do you think art makes now? And how do you translate that from someone who's creative to someone who's not creative? What's the, what's, what, what's the difference between art and I, I'm just going to keep now. this real simple. There's a phrase that I always run with. It's not who creates it, but who controls it. Mm. All right? Think on that. It's not about who creates it, who controls it. Mm. So that's for us to control the shit that we create. Because if not, somebody else takes it yep. and rubs us out and puts another face and another t-shirt on that. That's that right. may not answer your question, but roll with that for now. Very quickly, uh, Mel- Mello, yeah. Hmm. You know, when we were doing what we were doing, 80s and 90s, everyone's social situation was different. Our economic situation was different, and how we lived was a bit different. We still were more together. I think what's happened now is that a lot of artists can become artists selling records or selling, you know, selling, getting their stuff out there, getting it heard. But they can develop at home by themselves and get to a level where they're brilliant, kind of thing. For many of us, we got to the level we got to not by staying home, but by like being amongst other people who were directly influencing us. And we were directly in the mix of the political, social, cultural thing that's going on around us. And our parents' generation 
and maybe our elder siblings generation might have come from Africa or come from the Caribbean. You understand what I'm saying? So it's another generation, generation X is a different generation, you know what I mean? How can people do that now, I think, was you saying? How does that translate now for people now? I think all the same things apply. The belief in yourself, authenticity, the hard work, the perfecting your craft, perfecting your skill. One of the big differences now, you don't need a publisher, you don't need a promoter, you don't need a record label, mm -hmm. you don't need any of that. And you don't need to pay thousands and thousands of pounds studio time to use it to make, <laughs> make yeah, a record. Too. So now it's easier. Plus they're exposed to so much different types of music. And like with the adv advent of AI, I'm hearing some wicked AI Ooh. tunes. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard I got five on it? Like, the so if people are gonna use that as a tool, it's what we come with as humans and we use what tools are there, but we don't know what we can make, you know what I mean? I think the things are still the same. Mm -hmm. Human beings have to utilize what we have. You have to have a vision and you go for it. Even if that is about fun and partying. Mm. And lastly, Devastate, yeah. question to you. I think it's an amazing time to be an artist, you know, because <laughs> like what you say, you don't need a machine. You know, you don't need, you don't need anything. You just need your laptop and you need, you need to have the balls to do it. Um, I, I wish that we had the tools that, <laughs> that are around now. Oh We'd be God, bloody man. millionaires, I'll tell you that. So I would say, <clears throat> um, go forth, go forward with your art. But the only thing I'll say about these days is that there's a lot of clones. I think so many trends, people want to, you know, be the next hot thing, so they, everybody's doing the same thing. So I think that's the downside of these days. So my advice to any artist, just stay in your lane, man, and stay in your lane and just stick to what you want to do, man. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, uh, does that address... Does that, does that address your question? Oh, what a Jerry Springer yeah, sign no off. Nice. Oh, okay. And thank you, everybody, for throwing the questions out there. Um, so the book <laughs> is Original London Style. You can get it online. You can have a look in the Street Culture Library. Would you please make some noise for Barney Bread, Mellow and Devastate? Wow. Can I can I big can I big up my generation, please? Yeah. Yeah. Talking about my generation. It's lovely to see all the grey beards up in the place. <laughs> salt and pepper, salt and pepper. <laughs> so that's it, it. Thank you so much. And listen, I can show you around the back there as well. We've got the graffiti exhibition. I'll do a grand tour for all of you if you fancy it. And we've got the Street Culture Library in the back as well. Listen, Killer Keller, out like in was out of fashion, all right? Remember, crime don't pay, but neither do they. Stay lucky, <laughs> take care of yourselves. It's the beginning of a Friday evening. You're going to love it. Easy. No problem, no problem. Go, man. Go.